All right, we're very honored to uh, um, recognize uh, some of our students tonight. Um, I'll read through the uh, awards that we're going to um, nominate and kind of give to these recipients. And I just want to thank them for all of their hard work. Um, my little write-up, I think, is pretty good, but it does not say enough about the impact that these students have had on the student body as a whole in their leadership. Um, but here we go. I'm really excited. This is the fun part of my job. Um, the first one is the Mass Certificate of Academic Excellence. So this award is des uh, designed by the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents for Academic Excellence. It's to be given to a high school senior who has distinguished themselves in the pursuit of excellence during their high school career. Um, our recipient, uh, you don't have to get up right yet, Olivia, Olivia Hansen and um, Olivia Hansen is a representative of the Newburyport Ed Foundation, as well as the president of the National Honor Society and Best Buddies member. In addition, Olivia has also been one of the student representatives for the school committee for the past two years. Along with her commitment to these activities and roles, Olivia has worked diligently to keep herself in the top 5% of her graduating class. She's also on track to receive her associate's degree from Northern Essex Community College by graduation. In her spare time, uh, which she doesn't have a lot of, but when she does, um, she works at the Tinker House for, as an assistant art teacher. She also teaches piano lessons and assists in directing the local children's choir. Her level of responsibility and interest in learning is second to none. One of our teachers describes Olivia as an academic sponge. And when it comes to her leadership, the National Honor Society advisor notes, Olivia keeps excellence in the forefront for all activities and understands that we're all about service and school, uh, service to the school and the broader community. So at this time, I would like to uh, present Olivia Hansen with the Mass Certificate. Congratulations. All right, our next award is the National School Development Council Award. Um, so this award is offered uh, to the NESTEC affiliated school districts and the New England National School Development Council. It's presented to a high school senior that has consistently pursued a high level of academic effort and have also served as positive role models for the student body. Recipients of this award have admirable character and accomplishment. The following two seniors will be recognizing for this award is Rhea Kaur and Avery Hawkeiser. All right, not yet. It's Hawkeiser, <laughs> proud dad over there. Let me just read a little background on these two outstanding uh, students. Rhea Kaur, as described by her teachers, Rhea is a sharp, motivated, and dedicated student, both in her academics and as part of the school community at Newburyport High School. For her entire tenure at NHS, she has been a proponent for elevating student voice. Whether it's a four-year member of the student council, an executive member, an officer of the student council, or an officer to the Bring Change to Mind Club, Rhea has been an asset in helping improve the school climate of Newburyport High School. In this role, she has also served as a positive role model for her peers in regards how to engage in effective dialogue around school and community issues. Alongside of her active involvement in the school, Rhea's teacher described her as a love for learning, so much so Rhea's take advantage of the many enrichment opportunities provided by the school system. For example, this past summer, Rhea participated in the Summer Academy and developed a TED Talk to explore the topic of her choice more deeply. This is just one example how Rhea demonstrates the love for learning. 
So congratulations, Ria Kaur. Our next uh, recipient is Avery Hawkeiser. Uh, once again, all these students are the top 5% of their graduating class. During her time, uh, Avery at the high school has taken on multiple leadership roles. Along with serving as a student representative to the school committee for the past two years, Avery serves as president of the German National Honor Society. She's also the president of the National Art Honor Society. And in both organizations, she takes an active role in developing agendas in serving as a right-hand person for the advisors in coordinating activities, service opportunities with the other student members. Outside of the student leadership role, Avery takes part in activities to expand her learning and interests. For example, she's been an active member of the NHS Book Club, where groups of students come together to discuss common books each month. In the classroom, Avery's always showed high commitment to her studies and has challenged herself whether by taking advanced placement courses or dual enrollment classes, where she is also on track to earn her associate's degree by this year's graduation. Um, this is just another example of her commitment to her education. Congratulations, Avery. Great job. I also want to thank the parents, um, doing a great job raising these young adults to um, move forward in the world. And by the time I retire, they'll be taking care of me. So I appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. For our consent agenda, Mr. Callahan, any warrants? Yes, we have uh, three warrants. I move that the following name bills of the Newburyport Public Schools amounting in the aggregate of $852,358.19 be approved and forwarded to the city auditor for payment. There are no conflicts. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, we have one set of minutes to approve this evening from the October 17th meeting. Are there any corrections? Ms. Walker? Vice Chair, on page three, related to the vote regarding the fair share amendment, um, I believe it should reference the resolution. It doesn't. Ref it doesn't reference that. It just says we voted to support the fair share amendment. I, I think it should say we voted to support a resolution supporting the fair share amendment. So I would just make that change under the vote. Um, so Do you see that, Ms. Yell? Under on page three, under voted. Yep. To support, to voted to support a resolution, I guess is what we would say, supporting the fair share amendment. Where it says voted. Yep. Voted on, could we say voted on a resolution yes. in support of? That sounds good. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have one. Um, if you go to the top of the minutes under public comment, the first name is incorrect. Where it says Sandy Moore, I'm not sure how we got that name. Her name is Annie, and her last name is Maurer, which is M-A-U-R-E-R. -E Any other corrections? Can I get a motion to approve the October 17th minutes? Motion to approve is amended. Second. All in favor? 
Aye. 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 All right. Student representative report. Busy night for you two. <laughs> <laughs> So from first with the Bresnahan, the Bresnahan has started composting. Thanks to teachers Katara Harding, Sarah Barola, and Aaron Kelly for starting this program, partnering with Black Earth Composting. Teachers volunteered to have individual bins in their classrooms to pilot this program. We have an after-school composting club, and we plan to do a full assembly to teach students how to compost in the cafeteria. We are excited to link this to our science and STEM curriculum, as well as teach students about their own environmental impact. The new Clipper courses are up and running. These courses include Spanish, typing, theater, reading, math games, gardening, and so much more. Over 175 students participate. Salter Bus Company is providing a late bus to encourage all students to participate. The courses are free of charge, and we now have a vibrant after-school program. Thank you to the Bresnahan staff for making this happen. Now from the high school. Um, Newport High School would like to recognize our Bring Change to Mind students. Last week, they organized a Purple Out to bring attention to their efforts around destigmatizing mental health in schools and the community. Also very impressive, our swim team, led by Abriana Konstrom and the other captains of the co-op team, recently, recently led lessons at the Bresnahan regarding being safe when swimming in the water. New Report High School has now joined the statewide mock trial program, which is designed to help high school students learn more about the law, court procedures, and our legal system, and give them an opportunity to sharpen their analytical listening and speaking skills. We would like to thank Turco Legal for sponsoring and helping us get involved in this program. We are also excited to have Melissa Martin serve as the advisor for the students who have committed to being a part of this experience. Okay, and continuing with the high school, over the next few years, the high school will engage in the accreditation process with New, New England Association of Schools and Colleges. This process provides for meaningful, ongoing whole school improvement. There are links on the website under principal announcements um, where you can go to learn more about the process. Um, and then now to talk a little bit about the NEF. Um, the NEF auction will take place on, I believe it's, Oh yeah, November 5th at 6 through November 12th at 8 p.m. And then November 12th is when it will be in person. Um, the NEF has been a tremendous partner for the public schools over the past few years. Um, high school students have benefited from an upgraded fitness facility, taking dual enrollment classes with Endicott College and at a significantly reduced rate. Um, also students enrolled in our STEM courses have benefited from this state of art state-of-the-art technology such as probes used to study the Merrimack River um, and high-end laser cutters. These are just some of the examples um, of support um, that NEF has provided to the high school. And then for a sports update and playoff results, field hockey, their record is 14-3-2, and, and they won their round 32 of the playoffs. Volleyball's record is 18 and three, and they also won their round of the playoffs. Girls' soccer's record is 17 and one, and they also won their, their round. Boys' soccer is 19 and 0, and they also won their round. Football um, lost their round of the playoffs, and cross country has a divis divisional meet Saturday, November 12th at Westfield at 10 a.m. That's it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I just want to add that we have the co-host to the NEF auction in the room, um, so if that's another great reason to come out on Saturday to City Hall, <laughs> Superintendent Sean Gallagher, Principal Andy Wolf. Oh, very uh, nice. We're, we're the MCs. We're, we're practicing, so practicing the jokes. Should be a show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Vice Chair Hall, I, that yes. was a great report. Thank you, guys. Um, I, I just want to say I'm really excited to hear about the composting program, and I don't Same. know if we've tried that, if that's the first pilot we're doing in the school, but would love to hear more about how that goes mm -hmm. and if there's opportunity to, to do that in other places. That would be great. Absolutely. I think a couple parents tried it a few years ago. There was <clears throat> Black Earth wasn't involved at the oh, time, okay. yeah. but now that there's an actual company involved. Great. Seems to be great. We do it at our house. It's awesome. Yeah. Right. We we had I think a lot of momentum, especially with the composting in the cafeteria, and then um, you know we had to take a break because of the yeah. that little pandemic. But we're restarting that uh, all over again. Great. So yes, yep. Yeah, that's great to hear. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're ready for the transportation committee report. All right, Ms. Walker. So I'm pleased to give um, a quick well. 
I don't know how quick it'll be. I'll try to make it quick. <laughs> but uh, there's a report in your packet. Um, it's basically the report back from our uh, committee that was formed um, in March um, at the direction of the school committee. Um, the school committee members are myself and Mr. Callahan. And we also had staff, uh, Superintendent Gallagher, Vice uh, Superintendent um, Ms. Ippolito. Uh, we had participation from um, the other staff were Nancy Price when she was here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, now, um, and then also Pam Keeley. And now Wes is, on, is part of our team, too. So we've had, and, and Mr. Little Hale, of course. Um, so great participation from staff and lots of good information provided um, by them. Um, I found it to be a very collaborative process. Um, a lot of it was getting us all up to speed on this, you know, what, what our requirements are in terms of providing bus transportation. Um, as you'll remember, part of the original reason for forming the committee was in response to a discussion around setting bus fees. Mm -hmm. And um, some of us felt that we just didn't know enough to, to make an informed decision about that. So um, I'll go through the report and try to highlight some of the key points and then try to focus in a little bit on the direction from here. Um, so <clears throat> first of all, um, we start with a presentation, I mean, a, a summary of our purpose, which was to guide the school committee on decisions related to school transportation, as I mentioned, specifically related to fees. Um, so to do this, our scope included reviewing and evaluating existing school transportation operations and practices, and then developing some suggestions for the consideration of the school committee, um, either revisions to existing <coughs> policies and or establishment of new policies, as well as some other considerations. Um, in addition, our committee wanted to wrap up our work prior to the start of the budget process, as well as in time to inform the setting of bus fees for the upcoming school year. So that's why we're reporting back now with that in mind. The report provides a summary of the information we reviewed and collected in order to inform our understanding of bus transportation in the district, as well as our requirements under state law, as I mentioned. So on page three, we uh, summarize the state minimum requirements. Uh, transportation must be provided by the school for students in grades K through 6 living more than two miles from school. And just to mention, that doesn't necessarily mean we get any reimbursement for providing that transportation. So that, that's largely borne by the school district. Fees may be assessed for transportation of students that live less than two miles from school. We, we aren't uh, under law allowed to charge for those in grades K through 6 who live more than two miles from school. No student is eligible for free or who is eligible for free or reduced lunch may be assessed a, free, a fee for transportation. And again, that's in the state regulations. And that's also reflected in our policy. <clears throat> so after that, we provide a summary of some comparative communities and their bus transportation policies. This was really largely a web-based research. So um, we did not actually call these communities up and make sure that the information on their web was accurate, but we were trying to find, find some comparable communities that we could compare to. So um, that's the information provided in that table. We, were, we reviewed all, any non-regional districts north of Boston, they're loosely in the North Shore area, if they were not also were not providing, um, were not provided MBTA bus service. We assumed that communities like that were not exactly comparable to us because we, can, we can't make use of that extensive bus service. Um, we also included uh, communities that are listed on DESE's District Analysis and Review Tool, or DART, as comparable districts, and those, are, those, those communities are on that table with an asterisk next to them. Um, new reports existing fees are highlighted in yellow on that first page, and I'll just mention what those are. So our existing fees are, we have um, a $300 fee per student. Um, there's no family cap, as far as I know. Um, the fee, uh, it's free for K through 12 who qualify for free and reduced lunch, as we've mentioned before, that's reflected in the state regulations, although we extend it up to, all the way up to, K, to t grades 12. So we, we add on to that K through six. And then, as well as K through six living two or more miles from school. Um, and then there's an $100 for each additional student over two. Did I capture that correctly, Superintendent? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> you'll see there's all, uh, if you go through those communities, it's really all over the map, more or less. Um, I would say that for the majority of communities do uh, charge a fee, although there are some that don't. Um, there are, the fees are pretty variable. Um, 
That's not to say that they aren't reflective of their transportation costs, because they are supposed to be um, based on the costs of the, of the transportation. They're supposed to be, you know, that you're not trying to make money off your bus fees. Um, there are, there's a range of communities that provide uh, transportation for grades that are uh, students that live less than two miles. Um, some have um, provide transportation for as low as those who are less than uh, five, uh, point, half a mile for free or and or a fee. Um, there's also some communities that established walk zones. So rather than using the the mileage specifically, they also develop walk zone maps, um, which basically um, they, they say, if you live within this walk zone, you're not eligible for bus <coughs> transportation because you have a safe walking distance and there's safe sidewalks and so forth. So um, again, a real range. We looked at, the, at all of these and thought about maybe some considerations from New, for Newburyport. Certainly, um, this is a resource that we could look at in the future too if we have other, other thoughts. So that was... <coughs> that process. Um, so next you'll see the summary of the transportation survey that was conducted for all Newburyport families. Really appreciate the staff's effort to get these, this out and we also translated it. Um, and, I, and I think we had a really good response. We had about 600, I think it was 640 or so responding. Um, a few that weren't in the, <laughs> that don't live in Newburyport even though we said it was only <laughs> for people who live in Newburyport. That's okay. It's, great that they responded. Um, it would be great if we did this every year. I think it helps us gauge, um, it, you know, trends over time and it's pretty straightforward and simple to do. Um, we, as you'll see from the summary, the survey responses were pretty evenly distributed by grade. Most of the people who completed the survey ride the bus most days to and from school most days. Um, sorry, I repeated myself. And also, um, and then the, the second highest number were people who drive um, to and from. Uh, again, that's the people who completed the survey, but um, we can probably make a fair assumption that there's more people who either ride the bus or drive than walk a bike. Um, we also asked some household transportation questions, which I think are telling of you know, some of the population that we're serving, as well as whether they intended to purchase a bus pass for the upcoming school year. Um, certainly, the COVID pandemic, as, as we all know, had an impact on those people who were riding the bus. So we're seeing, as, at least intent, the intention from the survey responses was that more people were gonna buy a pass than had last year. And then finally, we asked reasons why they opted not to use the bus or um, some general comments, and, and um, we summarize those on page nine. Um, you know, there's there's a mix depending on the age of the student. Um, there is some still some lingering anxiety. There's uh, de definitely people who feel that the bus fee is too expensive. Um, there's concern about the bus taking too long to get to and from school. Some safety concerns and. Um, and then I, we listed some of the other uh, sort of overall concerns. And then we provided a summary of the additional comments for your reading pleasure in the end of the report. <clears throat> All right. So the next section is the draft transportation goals for your consideration. Uh, the committee uh, discussed this sort of early on in our process, and I think we might have added to it over the course, but for the most part, they stayed the same. We could choose as a committee to roll these into our policy if, if that makes sense to people, but it, it also could just help us guide our decisions generally about um, bus fees and decisions we make around transportation. Uh, some key points to consider related to those goals. Bus transportation is generally safer overall for both kids, for both students and the general public than single occupancy vehicles. Um, that's just a matter of fact. It's also better for the environment and it reduces traffic congestion, and it can impact not just uh, if you take out, out the bus fees part of it, but the, the providing of transportation to and from school can be a financial burden on families if they have to drive. Um, so the goals also include reducing financial burdens on families, which relates to equity, and we also list working on ways to reduce overall transportation costs that go hand in hand. So, Certainly those are our goals, but we also would like to see us figure out ways to, to, to reduce the, the escalating transportation costs that we're all facing in the district and, and around the state. Um, I'm gonna just pause there and see if anyone has any questions on anything I went over so far. Or anything else that either you or nope. the superintendent wants to add. No. Okay. 
So the next section uh, summarizes some of the options that we considered as we went through our deliberations. Um, and you'll notice on the table that some of these options would require a policy change to our existing policies. Um, some would require actual vote by the school committee, some, some of those relating to policy. Um, and some really, I think there's a few here that maybe are out of our purview altogether. Um, so, you know, they again, they really scan, uh, span uh, the gamut in terms of both looking at ways to potentially reduce costs, reducing the, the burden on families, thinking about creative ways um, to also um, not just reduce the burden on families, but help them maybe spread out the payments, uh, make it more convenient for them if, it, if it's a one-time fee that's the, the most prohibitive. So I'll just go through these quickly. Um, you know, we, we did consider the no change to the bus fee. Um, that would impact our, our projected revenue and our total operating expenses. Um, and doesn't require a policy change. It would require a school committee vote because we do have to vote on the bus fee every year. Um, we could increase the bus fee. What was recommended, I believe, by Mr. Callahan initially was at $365. Uh, can you explain again why that, what that amount reflects? Was that, um, that related to the increase in? It was inflation related, inflation. and then Mr. Littlehale would um, prefer it be 360 because he doesn't like fives, so. Got it. So that was reflective of how much. Obviously, <laughs> deeply considered. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no offense to fives. We don't. Um, <laughs> so the pros of that would be a potential increase in revenue to offset costs. The cons are that we could see a potential reduction in overall ridership because people are balking a little bit at the fees in general. Um, it does increase the financial burden to families. Um, and then. So the additional consideration would be, does it, you know, so are we going to have projected revenue and what's that going to be? That would not require a policy change, but it would require us to vote on the fee. Um, we talked about reducing or eliminating the bus fee altogether. Personally, that is something I would love for us to work for because, as I mentioned, I believe that's an equity issue. Even though we provide relief to families um, who are on free or reduced lunch, I think there's, there's an overall expectation that I'd like us to get away from. But that being said, um, the, there, there is an option to reduce or eliminate it. Um, it would reduce the financial burden on families, could encourage increased bus use and decrease congestion around schools, all safety things we talked about. Um, but it would also have that, likely have that impact of reducing revenue to support operating uh, expenses. Um, and it would impact the budget. So again, doesn't require um, a policy change, but would require a vote. Um, we talked a fair amount about restricting eligibility for bus based on the distance from school. So, for example, reducing um, eligibility for people who lived within half a mile with the assumption that within that half mile it's safe for, for folks to walk to school. And this is where we get into the walk zones and we talked a little bit about um, doing some maps and I think the staff seemed like that might be a good idea too if we ended up going this direction is, is getting away from the measuring the distance from door to school for everything and trying to come up with some walkability ideas so that we could we could gauge you know how safe it is for people to walk to school. Um, this could potentially reduce bus demand, which we assume would have associated cost savings if we were able to reduce the number of buses. Um, could reduce uh, revenue from bus passes if we that's one of the cons and also will likely lead to more people driving we're not we can't assume everybody who lives within half a mile is necessarily going to walk um, so then um, that would require uh, both a vote to change the policy as well as a vote by school committee um, another option was limiting the grades eligible for bus um, so we like i said we are already doing more than what state law requires by by providing busing for all the way up to 12th grade um, we could reduce that um, eligibility. Um, again, similar impact, uh, potential reduction in bus demand would re likely reduce revenue. And uh, similarly, there would, it would be limiting options for students in grades eight plus, so we could potentially see more people driving to school and so forth. Um, one thing we thought might be a good thing to consider, and this would be more of a convenience, uh, we don't really think this would impact overall bus demand, but it might increase the participation in, bu in busing in general, which is offering a one-way bus pass option. So I think we used to, I know for a fact, and Ms. Keeley, Ms. Keeley I think actually said her kids participated in a one-way bus at some point um, when, when they were younger. So I think we did used to do that. Um, 
I think we'd have to talk to Salter Transportation to make sure that wouldn't be cumbersome, but um, basically, I don't think there would be a lot of policing of this. It would just give fam you know, I don't think the bus drivers would be expected to say, oh, you only have a one way, you're not on the bus. You know, I don't think we would do that, but we would give the families the ability to say, well, I only use it one way, so I only want to buy a one way pass. Um, so that's just a thought. Um, we do see that uh, I think that getting kids to school in the morning tends to be more of a headache for people, and so there's there's more likely for people to drive to school in the morning and for convenience, and then maybe in the afternoon there'd be more likelihood to use the bus. Um, we also talked quite a bit about offering a morning bus only for NHS, which I think we should definitely pursue more as an option. That would not require a vote by school committee. Um, it could potentially reduce the, the, the bus demand overall, and we think there's uh, some merit to freeing up buses for athletic and other activities after school. And um, honestly, the, um, the free MVRTA bus service could, could, does cover a fair portion of the, of the city, um, and we feel like you know, potentially students could make use of that. So that was something we thought would be interesting to consider. Um, and then the, the last few are, you know, things that are a little bit out of our control. Encouraging more walking and biking to school. Certainly we can adopt a policy. We can encourage programming around that, but we can't make people walk and bike to school. We can only work with the city uh, to make, make it more walkable and bikeable and hope that people choose to do that. Um, promoting the use of VRTA, I think it would be great if we could have a chat with them too about um, student use. Um, you know, again, I think that it offers a pretty um, great service as it is. Um, how convenient that is for students, I think we, we'd want to talk more about that. Um, and then this other one, offer a monthly payment plan, we thought would be a good option, um, regardless of what we do with the fees, allowing parents to pay not, up, not all at once, but spread out over the year, um, would really, I think, be helpful to a lot of people. I think that 360 or $300 fee right up front is part of the financial burden that's an issue for people. And if we could, we sort of all agreed that that might be a nice option for families if we could spread that out in payments, installments. And then continuing to work on routing efficiencies, which we had a, a presentation early on from Salter, and um, you know I think they are working on this, and we can continue to work with them on that. I, I think staff is, is doing a good job pushing for that, uh, but continue to make sure that you know they're avoiding deadheads and um, you know making making sure that we're we're using the minimum number of buses that we need to efficiently get kids around, um, and also make sure that um, you know we're providing stops where we need to and not over providing stops where we, we don't. So um, any questions on those options? Bruce. Um, <clears throat> I thought in the, in the past we had um, initiated some discussions with Merrimack Valley uh, Regional Transportation. I just, I know that we, we talked with them, um, but I don't know if there's been any follow up to that. I'm actually having discussions with them right now, not regarding the schools, but I can certainly bring that piece in. But they're working us right now to kind of rework some of the routes and the report. There's only two buses right now that come into the report, but reworking those routes to make it more accessible to the whole city, opposed to just you know a handful of. But but I mean that that busing piece would be great, you know, especially right now it's not you know it's free of charge and. The high school. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I can bring that into the conversation for that one. Great. Anything else? Did you have anything to add to our list of options? Uh, no, it's all great. Uh, thanks to Juliet, who did like 99.9% .9 of the work on this anyway. Um, I think the rest of us were just there for moral support. That's fine. Um, but it's a tremendous amount of inf information. It's all great. Uh, and the whole thing, there are great ideas. The, the one-way option, which Ms. Keeley told us was not too long ago. When your children did that? Huh? <laughs> But all right, so not not 50 years ago type of stuff, yeah. <clears throat> so I mean, I know that you know I joke about um, the whole later start thing and how we were told they'd never go for it, and then you started working here, and like a month later they said, yeah, we can change the bus routes. It was easy. <laughs> so I think we can do that again if we're going to do a one-way option or the NHS being only allowed to be one way, uh, and all of it. But at the end of the day. When we start doing the budget thing and we need three hundred and thirty-three thousand dollars for that year, um, we've got to we have to 
charge more for it. You know, the, the, the new parents, they see that $300 thing, that's sticker shock, right? Like, what do you mean? I used to take the bus for free when I was a kid reaction. So I think we can do, if not monthly, quarter, like, you know, September, January, May payments. I'm sure the people in Phil's department could handle um, collecting those fees like that. Um, but I don't know if we're really going to be prepared to vote on anything no. tonight, and right? Let me so. finish my presentation. I'm not done. Well, you asked me. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, did you have anything else you wanted no, to comment on? No, thank you very options? much. Okay, I'm sorry. Thanks again for your help. I didn't mean to be oh. snide. <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. Cole, and then I have a question. Uh, and I don't want to talk out of line here because I don't know if you're going to bring this up, but uh, has, has there been any effort in, if you will, of getting actual numbers on current ridership? Yeah, and, and that's, we, that's a great question. Let's go right into that. Okay. okay. Um, May so, I just ask one question? Yeah, Sorry. Um, this, this idea of walk zones is very interesting. I see other communities are doing that. I just want to confirm, we don't have anything like that now, correct? We don't have any area, oh, sorry, you're too close, you can't get a bus pass. Is correct. that correct? That's correct. Okay, just confirming. Yeah. Thank you. Can I have a question as well? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned students that qualify for free and reduced lunch are eligible. Is, where is that data from? Are those students that are identified as low income? In the system, or is there um, another measure? Does, do Mr. Littlehale, do you feel comfortable answering that question? Because I don't want to mess that one up. Or it's on the um, free reduced lunch application. <coughs> Can you come up to the mic, Mr. Little? Yeah. <laughs> Such enthusiasm. <laughs> I'm just getting a signal. She would, yeah, otherwise, they won't pick it up for the recording. Thank so you. We get the free reduced information from the free reduced application for school lunch where we put wording on it that says, you allow us to use this for other purposes. And if they agree to that, that's what, how we get it, that's what we get it from. Yeah. Okay, my, my question is in regard to the low income uh, designation of students. It captures a wider variety of student, uh, family populations than those that are eligible for that. So if, we, if, if you were to that's change another the policy, option. Mm -hmm. um, to those that qualify as low income, you might get a larger percentage of, of families who that that you know, bear the hardest, hardest burden. Yeah, so, so make, the, make the threshold a little different than the, just the three. Yeah, great, great suggestion. Thank you, Mr. Littlehill. All right, so I'm just gonna go on to the next section. Um, uh, so Mr. Littlehill provided um, information related to what we budgeted for fees compared to overall transportation costs. And um, so if we, this is for the current budget year. So if we receive the amount budgeted um, in our current budget, um, fees would account for just about 70%, 17% of the non-special education related transportation costs. So that's that, that memo in there. Um, the next charts were provided by Mr. Littlehill to the full school committee earlier this year. Um, if anybody has questions about those, but it basically shows the history of our transportation fees and, and the costs. And it, it reflects why we have fees, basically, because of those costs. Um, the next section, uh, we summarize the number of pass passes issued this year by type, whether it was fee or no fee, grade, and distance from school. Um, so that answers, uh, Mr. Cole, your question. Um, and I can pull that up so that I can talk to that. <clears throat> so um, those who are eligible by state law are those that, we, we broke this down into three categories, but basically the first two are those that are um, have to pay a fee, and then um, those that, that don't. So those who, so who do not pay, I'm sorry, I said that in reverse. Those who do not, do not pay are those who are eligible by state law, grades K through six, and live more than ten, two miles from school. There are 315 of those riders. Those who are eligible by school committee policy, um, this year there are 170 riders, and that's row two, a row two on the table. Um, those that, who are not eligible for a free <coughs> waiver, um, or no fee, um, are, there's 516 of those riders. So see that breaking down. Um, so then I did a little nerdy thing and um, used Google Earth to do an estimate of our current students and how far they live from school as the crow flies. Now, we have to measure from their door by road miles. We can't, we can't use the crow flies because no one's flying to school. So um, this is more of an, a comparable illustration of where people live and how they're distributed through this community. So you can kind of have an understanding if we were to change eligibility, how that would impact different student populations. Um, 
again, this is an estimate because of that, so the numbers aren't going to exactly reflect, like, for example, Mr. Littlehill's numbers because I probably captured them a little differently. But um, it just sort of was an opportunity to, be, to, to give you all some data as we're thinking ahead and the potential implications if we were to change the eligibility. Um, so those are those fun maps. Um, and then finally, the change, the recommended or suggested considerations uh, related to changes to the policy. Um, we did not, as a committee, sort of vote and say this is what we're recommending, but we put these together as sort of food for thought. And my suggestion would be that we would get feedback today and maybe refer this to the policy committee to bring back to the full committee if there's interest in making changes. Also, there's a proposal in here uh, to adopt an, a, a safe routes to school policy. This is recommended language <coughs> from the state safe mm -hmm. routes to school program. Um, and that is a summary of our report. So just to let you know what I think my recommendations might be at this stage after we have some discussion um, is if we decide we're ready to refer the draft policies to the policy committee with any additional considerations. We would, I would recommend we vote to do that. Um, I also think we should consider when to have a conversation about this year's bus fees. I don't think tonight's the appropriate time. I think we need to digest this information and maybe think about the policy as well. Um, but make sure we can give families plenty of notice and also make sure that those fees are part of our consideration for the budget. So um, maybe I would look to the superintendent and Mr. Littlehill about timing of that discussion, but, um, but that would be my recommendation, those two steps forward. And that concludes my presentation. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I would just like to just take a minute to thank Ms. Walker for uh, keeping us, I think, uh, focused and uh, providing multiple options um, uh, just a job well done and uh, reaching out to other communities and um, so I do think we have some options uh, to discuss as we move forward I part of our uh, I think numbers once we get you know if we're looking of informing parents I think you know after the the new school year would probably be a good time mm -hmm. if we're getting closer to uh, changing the bus fees or changing um, how we're operating right now would be a, probably a good time because that's when, when we talk about the budget. Yeah. The preliminary uh, overall budget presentation school committee is usually in January, so we can include fees as part of that discussion. And I think, do we typically notify parents? Uh, we send out the request for whether they're going to take the bus next year. What, how early do we notify parents? Usually, it's night? usually the, I, I think it's the springtime, but okay. I, I mean, I think we've been we haven't really changed that mm -hmm. so i think if we are going to change it i we think in january february more notification yeah, yeah just to give them a, a little okay you know, a little head a little more of a heads up on uh, busing especially some of the ideas of um the high school students yeah. um you know i know some communities transport in the morning um just because we want to get all the students here but as you know the sports report that we had and all of the activities we have after school many of our high school students are are here so you might be able to accommodate students that need a ride home you know with a late bus and not the you know i think we have six buses coming after school yeah um so i think those are some of the discussions that we can look at so, go ahead so committee member walker thank you for all that that was that was really helpful i I'm glad we're going to take some time to think about this. I, I just want everyone to understand probably the next two years are going to be pretty tough for residents in town. Um, I'm just looking. I've got a list here. You know, I'm, we're working on the tax rate right now. We're working on water and sewer, electricity. I mean, everything is going to be up this next year. So we're really trying to find creative ways to help save residents money. And even when we do that, it's still going to be a very tough, <laughs> tough year. So I just want everyone to kind of keep that in mind. And I think if there is an opportunity to do something outside the box or things we've been thinking about for a long time, this is a great year to try something like that, too. Thank you. I'll echo everyone's sentiments. Very, very uh, valuable information, and I really appreciate the work you put into it. Um, I support the idea of referring this 
to policy to come up with a recommendation since I'm not a member of that subcommittee. I, I just would like to say that uh, I would support the idea of um, coming up with some of these creative solutions for reducing costs as opposed to raising fees. I think that makes a lot of sense. And there's some great ideas here with walk zones or uh, one-way uh, one uh, routes where we could reduce our costs with fewer buses. So I, I would love to see the policy committee take a, a closer look at some of those options. Mr. Menon? Do, is there a, a formal process for creating walk zones or identifying walk zones? Um, I think that's a good question. Um, I believe some of our staff has had experience with that in other communities they've worked in. Um, we obviously this. I'm just watching this clock like spin around. Is that did that just start? <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, that was a little distracting. It's just the, so hopefully it's not almost 10:30. <laughs> I mean, um, that wasn't great. How long was that report? <laughs> 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 it went on forever. <laughs> Um, sorry about that. Um, so but I think it's um, the you know, we'd have to make sure we comply with the law in term, I mean, the re requirements in terms of the distance that we have to provide kids, um, you know, so those walk zones would have to comply with that, that regulation. But um, there's certainly other communities that we could look to for examples. Yeah. I, I, you know, have, having seen some of these, you know, the, the bike to school days and the walk to school days, I, th I think those are all really, really great ideas. One of the challenges has been over the years for kids walking to school in the winter mm -hmm. has been sidewalks don't get cleared by, uh, right. by the landlords and the owners. Right. And that becomes a problem because then they have to step around out into the street Correct. and that becomes really dangerous. So, so one of the things that we could do going forward is, is perhaps looking at stricter enforcement of that. It's a regulation, you gotta clean the sidewalks, but it's, it's rarely been enforced in all the years that I've been here. Yeah. yeah, we have we have some new equipment too for the DPS this year, so we do hope to expand that, especially for safe routes to schools. Um, you know, it, it, sh it will be a part of the snow and ice uh, plan that we'll present. But um, you know, I think this year for sure we'll probably pay a little bit more attention to the the constant people who aren't living up to their end of the bargain, and hopefully working with them and, and, and straighten that out. I know low streets particularly difficult um, in the winter, so. But I think some of that's the contractors too because when they bury corners, like at Kent Street and High Street, the winter of 2015, I know it was extraordinary amount of snowfall, but that was like an eight foot hill on both sides. You can't, yeah. you can't dig that out, right? So I don't know how DPS or um, the city in general will call them and say, think about where you're putting all that snow. You know, I don't know how that would work. But that's why you're the mayor, so you can figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Cole? Yeah, I just had one uh, question uh, on regarding the address distribution. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if it's, I think the number of families that have children in the schools is about 1,100. Is there any? Can families? Um, I don't know the number of families. I'll, this this is the number of students. So there could be multiple families, multiple students. Okay, so that's 624 that is, uh, or whatever it is. Um, six, yeah, 624. I don't. Uh, I guess what I'm I trying to. I can get it, but. I guess what I'm, and, and again, I'm not trying to pick <laughs> anything apart. I'm just seeing, because uh, I, I looked at the uh, you, you Google Earths. Mm-hmm. Uh, diagrams of like Plum Island, mm -hmm. and uh, this seems to if that if that number which is like on the address distribution is like two five six nine. Two, yeah, I think it's right, and I think there's a uh, lot there's a lot more kids in those Google Earth views. So I, I guess what I'm just trying to say is that in terms of response. Do we have a good summary of data here, you think, or is it like 50% or, like do we have 50, what, what percent of families are responding basically? So this is actually based on actual addresses from the school. These are not surveys. Um, okay. These were, uh, this is information that the school provided I me mean, with private privacy, you know, yeah. no, no names attached. These are addresses um, of existing students in Newburyport. Okay. So there's only 624. 
No, no the whole that's thing adds up to twenty. Yeah, it's a whole thing. Whole, 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 all the numbers add up to over two thousand. I think it's like right. Yeah, it's over two thousand students. So you're telling me that I'm not sure. So there's two thousand students and six twenty four families. That's like more than three kids. No, 620. 20. No, there's multiple. 624 right. 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 charts. So what I'm trying to figure out is how many families there are in your report. So, um, Mr. Cole, there are two different maps here. Yeah. The If you're talking about the survey map, yeah, those I'm are the number of people who responded okay. to the survey. Okay. And you're right. That was only 620. Each each family was asked to fill one survey out per child. Okay. So that doesn't necessarily reflect that. It, it probably reflects the number of students, okay. you know, yeah. approximately. Uh, but then later on, I did the Google Earth analysis that includes all of the students, and that's over 2,000 students. Okay. I'm just, like I said, I'm just making sure that the, the data that we're basing this all on is as complete as possible. Yeah, I understand. And, and that's why um, in the survey responses, you'll see... Um, it's always good to know who's responding, and most of the responses were um, families who, who, a lot of the responses were families who use the bus already. So you'll see um, on pages um, six and seven, um, all the green, those are the people who responded. So they, they use the bus going to and from school. Okay. And then um, of the people, then the next highest use was the uh, driving their car. Um, and then you'll see also the distribution on page six, you'll see the distribution by um, grade, and we got a pretty even distribution by grade. And then the map you're referring to, that first one, the address distribution, I think we also covered a pretty broad, you know, again, it's not completely matching our just geographic distribution, but it's a pretty broad distribution of families. So that being said, it's just more about reasons why they may or may not take the bus. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's just more information to receive. It's not necessarily something we want to hang our hats on and say, well, if we make this policy change, we're going to get, you know, this many more people riding the bus. It's yeah. just more to, to one more data point. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I think we might be ready for that motion. Sure. So uh, I guess I would move that we... Um, refer the two, the proposed draft policies um, to the uh, policy committee for a report back to the school committee at a future date. Second. Discussion? And I would just add that um, we will incorporate the comments from tonight related to um, some of the comments that the members had about um, additional considerations for those policies. Great, any other questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 So, Ms. Walker, <laughs> you're up again, <laughs> okay. but keep this uh, as informal as you'd like. <laughs> We'd love to hear about the results yeah. of the uh, the mask resolutions, yeah. MASC resolutions, excuse me, and then anything else you'd, you'd like to share at this time. Sure. So, I was um, happy to be able to attend the MASC conference uh, in Hyannis. Um, to appreciate the opportunity and also represented the school, the, our district um, in the, as a delegate on the voting of the resolutions um, that have been proposed for consideration to the full delegate, delegate assembly. Um, <clears throat> just um, for those who aren't aware, resolutions are, are mainly just uh, recommendations. So the MASC body puts together these, well, individuals from the MSC body put together these resolutions, we vote on them as a body, and then they are taken to our legislative uh, folks, um, you know, and, and hope that eventually they might be crafted into some sort of legislation, but they're not written to be legislation, they're written to be recommendations. Um, the first resolution regarding sanctuary laws for transgender students passed, um, there was a, some amendments related to that, um, they added language um, to uh, indicating, clarifying um, re related um, medical care and mental health, so just to clarify that that was part of this consideration. Um, they also added some language related to providing safe school, home, and community. Um, and um, that passed 78 to 7. Um, just a, a note that I wrote down was, uh, Suicide ideation rate among trans students is one in five. It's kind of a shocking statistic. 
Um, the next item, number two, which was the um, to increase the maximum balance allowed by Special Education Reserve Fund passed with no changes. Uh, the next item was uh, resolution number three was membership of the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education. There was discussion around this. Um, there was an amendment to uh, include geographic diverse, a reference to geographic diversity as well. As I said, these are recommendations, they aren't requirements. Um, and um, that amendment passed as well as the full resolution. Um, number four also passed with no changes, and that was the preserving local governments of Massachusetts schools. And then five, personal financial literacy education, adding that requirement for schools also passed with no changes. And number six, the establishment of regional school assessment reserve fund also passed with no changes. For the most part, um, there was not a lot of opposition. We didn't, the only one we took a, role, a, a count vote on was the first one. The other ones was mostly just a uh, show of hands to see yay, and yays and, yays and nays. Um, I, my understanding of these can be very long, tedious votes. I'm sure other people have been to them in the past. I was pleased that it only took two hours. So. <laughs> um, but yeah, and, and in the future, I think um, there are workshops on these resolutions in advance if uh, maybe we can make sure that we let people know when those are happening so that we don't feel blindsided by them. Um, traditionally, and Steve can maybe speak to this a little bit more, but um, a lot of these resolutions are developed by school committees who are members of MASC, so it'll be a school committee that will bring an issue forward. Correct, yeah, so we, and if, if we ever want, think we have an issue we'd like to bring to the MASC, that'd be great, and the uh, staff can help us craft that, and there's lots of assistance, and a lot of, time, a lot of these were joint resolutions that were put forward right. by a number of school districts. Um, so overall, a very positive experience for my first MASC project uh, pro conference. Um, as I think the agenda lists, the, the focus was on diversity and equity and, you know, advancing um, that, those topics in our schools and how we deal with all, all of the folks that are in our community and support them to the best we can. Um, a lot of discussion, common themes were um, talking about post-COVID and I think just reiterating, as we all know, that you don't just hit a reset button and say we're done and COVID's done and now we're gonna go back to normal. That, that There is no normal at this point. And that, you know, I think just reiterating, and this is something I think we need to make sure we talk about through the budget process that learning loss is exhibited in a lot of different ways. And just using the numbers, the testing numbers as our message that, you know, we're doing okay or this population's doing okay or um, is, that, is that the only rule we're gonna use to track you know, that's, not, that's a mistake because learning loss happens primarily with COVID was primarily in social emotional development. And if we don't get our kids back on track for social and emotional development, all the learning recovery we try to do is gonna be useless. So I think that was a common theme I heard from presenters, but also from just dialogues with other school committee members. Um, we're gonna be, the next few years are all gonna be about making up for, the, for the, that time and whether it's academic recovery, but it's, it has to go hand in hand with social emotional learning. Um, rethinking our overall mental health and, and service providing, what we're providing in the schools. I mean, I think our schools do that already, but you know, mental health is, is a core part of our service now to our students, it has to be. And it also has to be for our staff. Um, and you know, lots of different ways we do that. Some of it is affinity groups, making sure that we, staff have support, that they can take a break during the day. Some of it's, you know, just making sure that they're getting the training they need to deal with a lot of the issues that we're dealing with. Um, so that was just an ongoing theme. I also went to some very informative um, sessions on communications. I think we're, we're on track with communications. It sounds like we're doing the right things. Um, one of the key messages was have a core message and make sure we keep reiterating that everywhere. Like, not just in the communications we're putting on a website, but when we talk about our budget, when we talk about policies, like going back to that core message. So I think that's really um, good that we're making that, that, um, that step forward in that way. Um, a great session on leading with equity. Um, I'm gonna just pull up who the speakers were. 
uh, panel discussion led by Emmanuel Fernandez, who is the Chief Equity Officer in Cambridge, um, and then a really great uh, panel, uh, primarily uh, BIPOC individuals, um, and it was just very great. A lot of sharing of personal experiences, but also just um, you know navigating difficult conversations and how we do that and how important that is. And um, and there was some great student representation as well. So that was really inspiring and also um, good to hear. Um, yeah. So overall, great. I, oh, I also did go to the Division One check-in, we are part of Division One for MASC. Um, they are gonna try to do some lunch and learns on a monthly basis that are over Zoom, so we don't all have to you know, congregate somewhere. Um, there was interest in that Division One communities of doing that, and we would sort of pick the topics. And so that might be interesting if people don't wanna travel to a conference, they can t t participate in a, in a Zoom lunch and learn. So they're gonna try to do that, and uh, the last thing I'm supposed to mention is that MASC is looking for members on their, on their subcommittee. So if anybody's interested in getting involved with MASC, <laughs> um, I can let you know who to reach out to. And that's Thank it. You. Thanks. Yep. Questions? Comments? Superintendent, yep. did, did you make it down? I did not. You're busy. A little bit. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we're ready for, is this correct, FY24? Is that what we're? Yes. Wow, okay. FY24 budget <laughs> guidelines and schedules. Yes. So we're, we're um, I'll present from my uh, seat right here. So it's not part of my accommodations. I like to stand up and move around, <laughs> but so I'm gonna have to take a break. You can go to that mic. Oh, I could. Yeah. No, we'll, we'll go from there. Um, well, first of all, I just, uh, once again, just want to thank the school committee. Um, I, you know, the transportation committee was, was a great, um, I think effort by, I think all of us and, um, a lot of the topics, uh, that we, um, Ms. Walker was talking about with the school committee throughout the state. Also the North Shore superintendent's round table is also talking about these, uh, topics and, and the, the budget impact, you know, coming down down the line so um, today's we'll just really kind of give an overview of our budget and kind of where we're at um, as I walk everybody through so I provided in the school committee packet just kind of like the timelines um, of a draft you know as we go through our budget process so as we're looking um, at the PowerPoint so as we all know when um, we get back on track and we open up school, our uh, school councils uh, review the school improvement plans, but also in October and in November, they begin their um, school budget discussions to really support the school improvement plans. I think what you're gonna see once we get to the district goals and going all the way back to the strategic planning is everything is tying back to the strategic plan uh, of the community. So there's a lot of, uh, I think, consistency um, throughout the school councils to the district um, goals. Um, so we're excited about that. We're in this process right now, which is kind of like November. Um, so development of the budget guidelines uh, based on our strategic plan. Um, and that's kind of where we're at uh, with that. So part of our budget guidelines that Mr. Little Hale and central office staff are working on uh, is just to really inform all of our budget holders on the process. So typically, um, we have uh, four different forms that they look at with some guidelines around that. The first one is staffing changes. So what we really <coughs> ask our budget holders uh, to look at um, is if they are recommending a staffing change or a staffing increase, the first thing um, for them to do is really look to offset. So it's not, in our philosophy as we develop our budget, it's not just to add staff to add staff. If we're looking to add staff, really take a deep dive uh, in can we reallocate the staffing patterns within each building or within each department. So if we are adding a staff member, it really offsets the budget, so not just to add to add. 
And I think um, the school community members that have been with our uh, with with me for the past uh, you know four or five years uh, really see that we just don't add just to add. The second piece that's really important to us um, is another uh, form that we utilize. It's called Form B, but really looking at the non-salary line items um, as part of our guidelines, and that's just a really justification of the non-salary for all of our uh, budget holders. For example, instead of just putting in, we need twenty thousand dollars of professional development. Let's say at the Bresnahan, you know we really have them break that down. Anything really over $3,000 or more um, as we develop our budget uh, guidelines and, and working with our individual budget holders, they just really got to justify uh, to us, you know, what's that look like and why? And once again, can they reallocate those, those funds? Um, especially with the advancement of technology. So some of your materials that you needed, you know, five or seven years ago uh, might be obsolete now. Um, so those are the discussions um, that we have. And then the last couple other areas that we focus on is facilities repair and improvement, which comes under Steve Burkholm. But a lot of times your budget holders, the people within the schools, can um, give us a, a checklist of things that they're seeing that might need you know, repairs. And then the last piece that we're really proud of that we've done over the years is new programming um, or new special requests. Um, and once again, for all of the budget process, we always look, can we offset that within the operational budget? Can we reallocate uh, staffing or funds? So off the, I think right off of the process, we're not just adding more to our budget. Take a deeper dive and look at our operational budget, staffing patterns, and can we just you know, really do, do more with what we have without you know, really come into the city and, you know, asking for a lot of, a lot of new funding uh, prospects. So that's part of our budget guidelines that we'll send out to our budget holders. And then we develop the calendars, what I provided to school committee. So you can see kind of uh, a draft of how the budget will, um, you know, kind of work from there. So after our individual budget meetings, um, what I always experienced as a principal, that as I always said as a superintendent, we'd do it a little bit differently. And now that we have the strategic plan, it all ties together. So sometimes in some districts, the principal would submit the budget to the superintendent. Then after a month or so, you'd find out what you got and what you did not get. So what we do is we take all of the individual asks um, after these individual meetings, and then through the month of December, we have budget deliberations with the entire extended leadership team. So for all of the asks from Steve Burkholm, from HR to every principal, and then we take a look at our strategic planning, and then we have a discussion where we start looking at the priorities for the district. So for example, I give an, um, if Mr. Wolf needed a, um, let's say a history teacher to run uh, more electives and the middle school principal need another adjustment counselor uh, for the needs of their students, we'll have those discussions. And so, for example, through that process, um, the high school principal might say, you know what, I can wait for that history teacher for the following year because listening uh, to the needs of the middle school, we need that adjustment counselor. So we have that budget, those budget deliberations uh, throughout December. And then what we do for our school committee is in January, we'll give the overall preliminary budget of kind of where we're at with all of the different asks. And then we move into our budget form um, where that's where we bring in all the budget holders, the principals. So all of the asks from the original uh, individual meetings, you will all see that. Um, and then depending, working with the mayor and the city and kind of getting input from school committee, then we continue with our budget deliberations um, and then we'll start to, you know, I guess revamp um, what it's, what it's going to look like. But I think what we're excited about um, is all of this work that we're doing this year is going to tie directly to the strategic plan um, that we developed with the... Um, you know, with the community. And part of, 
as we move into the, the next portion of the district goals, you can kind of see how it's all coming together um, from all that work that we did over the past year uh, with the strategic plan. But that's kind of the draft on the calendar and kind of what that's going to look like. I thought we did a wonderful job last year. Um, from January all the way until um, the approval of the school committee, I think we had on the uh, school committee agenda, you know, budget update, budget presentations. Um, I felt we did a nice job keeping everyone well informed throughout the process. We received some positive feedback from the community and also from school committee members, and I think we're going to continue that same process um, moving forward. So. Um, now that I think the, the one piece that you'll see is how it all ties back to the strategic plan. So for the next you know, five years, um, you'll see a lot of the, those uh, agendas and um, you know, what the community wants and how is it being reflected <laughs> in the budget. So that's just a quick overview of some of the timelines um, that you'll see and, and you know, there'll be more I think detail as as we move forward um, as a school community. So that's kind of the just quick overview of what to expect for the budget season. Mr. Menon. Yeah, can you, um, in terms of the process, can you speak a little bit to the role of the school council and their involvement in the process, budget process? Yes. So when, as you all know, as part of the school council, the school improvement plans, um, they oversee those. Um, and typically it's a two-year plan. Um, so there's um, a student learning goal, there'll be a professional practice goal within the schools, and then a school goal is what your school councils uh, own. Um, so in every building, it's going to look a little bit different, but it's going to tie back to um, the strategic plans. So as part of that process, the school council, there'll be elections if there's open seats, that's in September. So October they review their uh, school improvement plans and then part of this, the November and December, is kind of how they're gonna fund some of those school-based initiatives, uh, working with the administration. So as part of the proposal that each building principal will bring it will be input from the school council so that's an important aspect um, just because of um, the the school improvement plans tied directly to the to the budget process um, and what we're excited about when we go through our district goals um, it's from the district goals it's actually from the community strategic plan to the district goals to the school improvement goals then you'll see it the administrative goals to the educated goals. So we really believe it's everyone's moving in the same direction. So it's not, you know, someone just, hey, we want this just because. It's really tied to the mission of what we're, <coughs> what, what we're trying to do. Yeah. Thank you. All right. And I think as part of that budget process in, Janu in February um, <clears throat> for the budget forum, that's where we introduced some of the um, school council members, some of the parents that were part of that. Right. So each school uh, will be presenting in February at the budget forum of the different goals. So. Could you speak a little bit about the agenda and what we can expect from the joint meeting happening next week? That's where um, it's like a relay race, so I'll pass that off to the mayor right now yeah. because, <laughs> but basically on the school side, I can just talk to the school side. So the school side, we just kind of give a state of the schools of kind of where we're at. So as we're going to begin this budget process, um, so we'll give an overview of, um, similar to what we've always have had, um, of our numbers, school choice numbers. We'll get, um, we'll talk about transportation costs, special education costs, the overall uh, staffing. So we kind of give the big picture of where we're at right now as we begin moving into our budget season. Yeah, and for those who haven't been part of this meeting before, so we do this every November, it's part of the charter. Uh, so we'll kick off the meeting, I'll kick off the meeting, and then I'll turn it over to our finance director, Ethan Manning, who will just go over the city finances, all right, talk about uh, revenues expected, expenditures for this coming year, 
Uh, we'll talk about debt service. We'll talk about the tax rate. Um, like I said, we've got a lot of kind of difficult decisions to make as we go into, um, like I, I would say the next two years are going to be pretty difficult uh, here in the city. Uh, but, you know, luckily we're, we have a strong financial background and uh, I think we're in a, a good position for that. And then we'll turn it over to the schools and kind of get what, what Sean just talked about. But it's usually a good opportunity. We don't get together. You know, we just did the other day, but you know, we typically those joint meetings don't happen very often. So it's a good opportunity for, for both elected bodies to get to get, get, to get together and really get kind of get your head around what's it going to look like this budget season. It kind of kicks off and you get into the holidays and then, you know, really January you're off and running with those types of things. So should be a good meeting. Thank you. Ms. Walker? Yeah, just um, following that, maybe either or both of you could comment on it. I, my understanding is when we, we'll have a new governor in January, so we won't actually know what our state uh, allocation is until later in the year because that when we have a new governor, it takes more time. Um, so do you have any thoughts on how that's going to impact our overall planning process or budget process or do you feel like you have a sense you're going to have enough of a sense of what we can expect I think it's typically like that I mean I mean it might be even a little later this year but I mean we're typically going through that process not knowing exactly we have okay. a good approximation so I don't think that changes it a ton it's just going to be a little later than usual this year and and for us I know um as I said I'm part of North Shore Superintendent's Roundtable so you know, there's there's a couple important questions for tomorrow. Um, I think um, you know regarding revenue for schools, and if you know the conversation, if that passes, how is that going to have an impact? You know, is if that passes, does it reduce the chapter seventy? And so I think there's some of those questions. And then the other piece as part of our budget process is our um, special education um, out of district placement. Um, you know, typically it rises uh, 3%, which was, I think, part of the um, the, the law in, in as much as they could increase. Uh, but there's something on the books right now that the superintendents are looking at that could go up to 14%, from a 3 to a 14% because of the inflation. And that's something as we work on our budget to really look at, you know, just off the top, if it, if those outside placements didn't rise, I mean, we anticipate a 3% every year. That's when we start. But if it was a 14% increase in some of the out-of-district placements, it, it would be around $500,000 additional. So that's a concerning conversation that uh, the North Shore superintendents are having, you know, discussions about. But I do believe it's, I think we anticipate, um, you know, typically, uh, you know, we begin the process of looking at cost of living um, is kind of where, where we start off. Um, but, yeah, so so we could have, I guess, some positive news if, if some of those questions move forward, or uh, if not, you know, then, then we just go back. But um, we'll see, I guess, to be continued. But that won't slow our process down because um, a lot of our asks are really going to be tied um, back to our strategic plan, and we and we don't limit our uh, budget holders. We don't, we don't tell them they, you know, as they develop, it's the goals. What do we need to accomplish? What do they feel is most essential to the school system, and then we go from there. So, speaking of goals, that was a very I nice transition. I have there. another oh. just a, oh, two yeah. quick yeah. things that I want to just make sure the superintendent um, considers going forward. One is I loved that you mentioned, you know, that that you don't hold back the budget holders and and but there are going to be some adjustments and maybe some some positions or needs don't get funded. I think it would be helpful for us to have an understanding of what those decisions are. So like maybe I don't it can be just a list or these were things we decided to to hold off for a future year. These were things that were asked initially but we decided because I think it's helpful not only for us but for the city council to understand this isn't a, we didn't put everything in here that we could possibly think of and we did, there were things that had to get taken out and these were the decisions we made about that. Um, so sort of what was not included, but what, you know, wishful thinking. Um, and then the other thing is, at, you know, reflective of tonight's discussion, making sure that we have opportunity to talk about fees and not just, not just transportation fees, but user fees broadly. I appreciate the summary that the athletic director provided to the finance committee and that you shared with us as well. I frankly was, was surprised that our fees cover salaries. Um, that really surprised me. I didn't know that. So, so those kind of things, just knowing what, and I think it's important for people to know what our fees are covering. Cause to me, that sort of could be an essential service that we're, 
putting on our families to support versus mm -hmm. including in the budget. So, so at some point in the process, whenever it's appropriate and whenever you think it's appropriate, it would be great to have that laid out for us so that we understand how that informs the budget. Great. Thank yes. you. Appreciate mm -hmm. that. I just want to say that too. I mean, I do think, I do like how you do that typically because, you know, by doing it as a priority, one, two, and three, you are having that conversation about everything that you're trying to include. So, I mean, I, I hope we continue that practice. I know last budget, that was my first go through uh, as mayor. So, I mean, I, I really do want to get away from, you know, the administration giving the schools a number and trying to fit everything in that number. I still liked having that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, then we'll know more once we kind of hear hear from the school side. You know, I'll be able to share more on the administration's, administration side where we, where we look like we're going to fall for the budget. So, great. Yeah, thank you. All right. Great. Ready for district goals? Do you district need to take goals. a lap first? Or? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had a flashback. I thought you were one of my coaches. I did something wrong. <laughs> take a lap. <laughs> um, no, we're, I mean, we provided, I think, for the school committee and, and the packet for our viewers, uh, more of a detailed um, overview uh, uh, regarding the district goals. So we're going to really just kind of go through how it all ties back to our portrait of a graduate and our strategic planning. So as you all know, um, we started this process on the strategic plan last, I mean, we, I think we forget. No, we started this last summer. And then as we opened up school, we were still dealing with a pandemic, if you recall. Um, so the work that we did on achievement of the strategic plan, I just want to thank our team back there and the school committee and, and everybody that rallied around uh, this development. So as you all uh, recall, some of the key elements um, for us that came out of that, what the community wanted, we had over 750 um, People um, participate in our strategic planning through the focus groups, through surveys, um, and we're just really proud of that. So some of the most, um, here are the elements that we've been talking about that the community wants to see in the strategic plan and portrait of a graduate. Uh, our students that are physically, socially, emotionally well, uh, literate across all disciplines, being creative, innovative, collaborative problem solvers, civically engaged, that's where uh, a lot of the um, student voices come in over the years, and then really prepared for life after graduation. Um, I think that that you know, is really what's guiding us. Um, and then the second piece to that is our strategic objectives. If you recall, the older strategic plan um, had you know, seven different strategic objectives. Uh, for us, uh, we condensed that down uh, to five. Um, so teaching and learning, support of all students ready to able to learn, a culture of self-discovery, personal achievement, organizational design and operations, and an active, um, an active community of stakeholders. So for us, the strategic theme is to reimagine an idea that reminds us it's continuous learning in uh, a cycle improvement, uh, hallmarks of effective education. So we have never been, uh, I think, since I've been here in Newburyport, we've never been status quo. I don't think we even, during the pandemic, we said, oh, we're not going to move forward, we have to deal. I think we move forward as a district, and I think the reimagining on how we can do things better on a daily basis is what really motivates this uh, faculty and community. Um, so I'm just really proud of that. So as we look at, um, as we align, as I was saying, for our goal setting, um, so we have the structures in place to guide <coughs> two-year goal setting plans at all levels. Um, and then these plans really tie in exactly what I was talking about. So this is um, a through line throughout the district. So at the district level, we have the district goals and improvement plan superintendent and school committee goals, which are tied directly to the district goals, and then annual updates to the school committee. So part of this and part of the feedback that um, we received is making sure that we're taking time out to update our community, update the school committee on the progress we're, we're making. So for us, we have a lot in our tactical aspects of the plan. 
So we were looking at possibly in February to kind of give a literacy update. So as you look at the district goals, there's a lot of literacy work going on. And then in May, come up with a special education programming update. We've added uh, a lot of programming throughout the district. And at the end, we felt like an idea that we have is kind of like we have state of the schools, but maybe in June you do state of the student where we take a break, maybe that last school committee meeting or the meeting right before our last, and just really update how our students are doing and focus on the, the whole student, not just the academic piece, but as Member Walker said, you know, the social emotional piece of that um, and where our students, uh, where they started in the beginning of the year and the end of, at the end of the year. So our school improvement plans, our principals, our school councils, annual updates, so very similar for me giving the annual update. So our principals do uh, updates to the superintendent uh, and then also to the school committee. So we're all looking at um, looking at that CISL ad hoc committee, I think down the line, uh, Mayor Aiden would like to see that become a subcommittee, but that might be a good opportunity um, for principals to report out to the superintendent and also uh, the school committee and the subcommittee um, you know, part of that CISL piece. That could be one of their uh, objectives. And then our educator goals are all tied back to the district goals uh, developed by the educators, and that is seen through our annual evaluation process. Um, so we really feel like uh, a big picture, we're all moving in the same direction here. Uh, from the educator all the way up to the um, superintendent, to the school committee, and then to the uh, general community at large that helped us develop the strategic plan. So as we said, we, we took a different approach um, in looking at Amy Webb's futuristic focused. Uh, I think the one piece that we learned through uh, pandemic is you can't be stagnant. You gotta be able to be flexible and change uh, on the fly. So we kind of uh, took her theory of um, successful businesses and how they can change uh, for the circumstances around. So as we all know, we're focus, focus, plan, and model. Um, so when we worked with our uh, community, they assisted with a portrait of a graduate. So our community really gave us the vision on what um, the graduates are going to need to be successful. Then as we were talking about our strat strategic objectives, those are those five strategic objectives that I uh, just talked about, so that's guiding our work. But for our educators, this is the really most important piece is um, having the ability uh, to operate on a daily basis where you reset. Um, you know, as Amy Webb said, uh, when you're getting evidence and you're looking at data on a daily basis, you have the ability to reset those goals. And that's the tactical piece. That's where the uh, education uh, goals, the educator goals, the one and the two year goals um, is really important for us. So we're all focused on that. <clears throat> so just um, taking a look, as we know, uh, the Department of Education, elementary and secondary education recommends the four areas for district goals. Um, so the first one is the professional practice goal. So for us as a district, it's increasing our instructional leadership and expertise, capacity within the district to support teachers in meeting the needs for all learners. Uh, so from the superintendent to the principals, um, really working with our leadership expertise throughout. As you also know, um, we've increased our teacher leadership capacity. So they also have been part of our uh, professional development. So we brought our vertical team teachers in as we're talking what good teaching looks like. So it's not just the administration, it's also our teacher leaders that are working with us on that. The second piece is our student learning goal um, to improve student achievement for all students um, while closing the existing achievement gaps for our economically disadvantaged students and students with learning disabilities. So it's an overall view of uh, you know, student achievement for all students on a daily basis. The third goal, uh, school improvement goals, um, this stemming back uh, really with the focus on looking at data. 
um, to make data informed decisions. So as part of our school improvement goal, increase our ability for our grade level content specific professional learning communities to use student, parent, and teacher friendly data cycles. Um, and a quick example of that is the student led conferences that just happened at the middle school where the students um, received a lot of positive feedback. I think um, Mr. Marcos' administration, along with the teacher leaders, in developing that protocol, where students talk about their data, the students talk to the, about their data to their parents on what they're good at, what they're feeling comfortable with, and then also the areas of growth that they need to focus on. So that would be an example of uh, you know, really taking a look at student data, but also having the students as part of the data conversations. And then last but not least is our district improvement goal uh, to continue with uh, comprehensive, rigorous, equitable, relevant curriculum aligned to the uh, master's curriculum frameworks. So that curriculum work is ongoing and it's live. It's not, I did my curriculum maps and you know, they're on the shelf. It's ongoing, continuous uh, work with our teachers and administration. We really uh, like that we shared. Um, I think as part of your, uh, is live links to this. Um, so when you look at the goals or on the left side, should the strategies, um, the five areas are up top. And then here are the, the tactical actions or the actionable pieces within the strategic plan. And we've made this live link, so if when parents click on that, what's that look like? It will link them back to the website and uh, should give them an understanding of what those will look like. So we're really excited about that. Um, and then that's for us, I think, for our community when people are asking, you know, what are we working on? You know, what does the strategic plan look like? What are the actionable steps? Um, people can click on those live links and get that information. And that's why we said as we looked at, like, what could we do? Instead of having myself go through all of this information one night with school committee, that's why we were figuring we could break up uh, the literacy because as you look through this, there's a lot of literacy initiatives. So that's why we felt like February would be a good time to talk about the illiteracy. As you look at this uh, action steps, um, there's a lot of work in special education development and program development. That's why we felt like May might be a good time to highlight that. And then as you look at this, there's a lot of work being done on social emotional learning. And then if we, in June, had the uh, um, state of the student, that might be a nice way of informing school committee and the community at large of all the work that we're doing. And I do agree with Ms. Walker, is I don't think we take time to really pat ourselves on the back on some of the great things that we're doing. So I think the messaging uh, for us is really to um, take a moment and show the achievement and show the, um, the, the uh, strategic plan and how we're doing uh, instead of waiting towards the end of the year. And I think as we get better at this, I think we make quarterly updates um, you know, going into the following year. So that's kind of our district goals. Um, and then in your packet, um, as I said, you have a lot more detail on some, what some of those um, anticipated outcomes are going to look like. Um, and then more of those action pieces. Just this last piece um, is part of my superintendent's report, but it, it got on the slide. <laughs> so this is, I might as well talk about this while we have it up. Um, <laughs> So this is a, a, a new law. So under suspensions, um, MGL 37 and 3 qu quarters. So part of a new law that's going to begin on November 9th is before students are suspended. Um, and this is why this is one of those, like maybe an unfunded mandate, because like, this was also a discussion uh, among the superintendents. But as I'm looking at uh, what's required now is the work we've been doing for five years. So when you look at before a, uh, a principal or an administrator can suspend a student, they need to explore these other avenues. 
So when you read um, what, what are these other avenues, you know, restorative programs, restorative justice, collaborative problem solving, educational programming. So we've, we have all of that. We've been doing restorative justice. We've been working with students in uh, the past program where they get counseling in lieu of suspension. The other piece is, uh, for us is just, you know, the documentation with that, but then also requires schools to implement district-wide uh, models, trauma-sensitive learning, positive behavioral support programs. So for our district, because we've invested in these valuable programs and our social-emotional learning pieces, we don't feel like this is a big stretch where we have to add, you know, and some other school systems, they have to add programming and they don't, but for us, this would be an example of the great work that we were doing uh, throughout. So this is just um, part of what we do on a daily basis. Um, you know, for us, it's just a little bit more documentation um, on before we're suspending still. So for us in Newburyport, suspension is the, the last resort because we try to do other aspects. Um, that's all. So that's off the superintendent's report, so we won't have to mention that. Um, and that's just overall kind of where we're at for our district goals, um, working with our extended leadership team, central office, principals. We feel it all ties right back um, to our strategic planning. Ian, it's something that um, we can track and we can report out on and um, analyze. Any questions? Yeah, just real yeah. quick. Yeah, it's just going to probably affirm what you just said. So come November 9th, you, you essentially already have a structure to deal with this 71, 37, and 3 quarter. Yes. And all your school, all the building leaders know that, and mm -hmm. it's ready to go. That's great. Yeah. That's great. <clears throat> It might be great too if we're going to start looking at the, that state of the student at the, in, in June to maybe then have a good presentation or at least sharing of information around discipline data that we can look at on a yearly basis. I don't know if we've done that in the past. Um, I know I've done it at other schools, but it'd be good to look at that. And then, you know, if we are, you know, looking at iReady and what, what we've been able to track this year, especially since, you know, I think, you know, MCAS is is down this year it's down all over the state we're pretty much in line with the state we won't find out until next fall but you know if we know in june what kind of growth we've seen throughout the year that'd be a good time to do that too yes yeah i just yeah. i just wanted to sort of reaffirm that when i saw this part of the presentation <laughs> i said already there mm -hmm. um and i i really appreciate the leadership that you and your staff have taken on, on uh, restorative justice. The, all these programs that have been in place, it's the way we've been operating for several years now. Um, and, you know, we have been leaders on the North Shore of trauma-sensitive training. So uh, it's just, you know, I, I feel really good about, um, I agree it's not an additional burden to us because we took it on four years ago. So thank you. Mm -hmm. And just credit our, our principals and leaders for really, I think, just putting our students first and understanding, you know, the whole idea on restorative justice is, you know, students are going to make mistakes, right? But it's really focused on bringing them back into the school community and not just, you know, suspend them for five days and then, and then that's it. So there's been a lot of efforts in that, and I think it also ties to the positive culture. I mean, that, that we've created, that we continue to focus on. You know, the whole idea of that sense of belonging is so important to us, you know. That reminds me of what you were saying at our safety forum about the importance of a, a student who could be a potential danger to themselves or others to actually bring them closer rather than push them away. So that's exactly, we're right on target with that. Right, thank you. Uh, yes, Ms. Higgins. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I had a question about the <coughs> learning goal. Um, have you 
Is it based in data that you've chosen to specifically focus on economically disadvantaged students and students with learning disabilities? Are those the largest achievement gaps in our district? Yes. So that's what we've been focused on is the achievement gaps for those students uh, overall. Uh, but we just didn't want to focus, you know, we want to focus on achievement for all students, but at the same time while we're doing that, we're closing those achievement gaps. And when we have our presentation uh, on MCAS, we've made some growth in those areas too, so that will be part of that. Are there um, also large achievement gaps across race, ethnicity, or English learners? Yeah, so I think we, we um, that's also the, I guess those subgroups were also including that, like our high needs population. Um, so maybe we can get a little bit more specific with that goal. Yeah, is that what you suggest? Just questioning the way that it um, reads. I wasn't sure if the if the achievement gaps only existed between those two student groups, or if those were the two student groups that you're specifically focused on. No, I think year. we're yeah. I think we were focused on the high needs uh, groups, which would also include our L population. Yeah. But we can we can tweak that. Superintendent, I believe we're on track for an MCAS presentation at our first meeting in December. Correct, Is December fifth. Mm -hmm. So that and other will assessments. Be. What's that? And other assessments, right? Yes. 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 <laughs> yes, that's correct. Um, great. Any other questions for the superintendent? Okay. So uh, I don't. I think we have much in the way of subcommittee updates, but we'll just kind of go through here. Um, finance, Mr. Callahan? No, we've not met. I think we meet Thursday. Thursday, Phil? The following, not this Thursday. It's the second Thursday <clears throat> this week. Hmm? It's the Thursday before the second meeting. Okay. The, yes. We have to get this actually like So next Thursday. So it's always the same. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> Sounds like it's settled with Phil. Yes, it was, it was Wednesday <laughs> that, until not long ago. That's fine. <laughs> All right, so we're good. It's not on the 5th, we're good. Um, Ms. Walker, policy? Yeah, um, policy is scheduled to meet on the 14th, um, so I will make sure we get an agenda out. Um, Mayor, are we, have you confirmed that Ms. Higgins will be the serving on the policy committee? Yes. Okay. So I'll make sure um, I coordinate with you and Steve on an agenda. We typically meet at seven o'clock and it'll be on the 14th at the, we meet in the Knock uh, library, middle school library. And I, I think if we can have a, our MASC representative uh, ready, I doubt that they're gonna be ready given they just got done with the conference, but hopefully we'll start working on that soon. Um, but there are some other items we can look at, some other, obviously what we referred to tonight, and then other policies that are kind of on the back burner at the moment. And I think one of them is a superintendent evaluation. So. Great. Um, joint Ed, we haven't and met that. since our last yeah. school committee meeting. Um, anything for <laughs> superintendent evaluation, Mr. Penny? <coughs> no, still. Pending? Waiting. Okay. Uh, and Ms. Walker, I feel like I should give you a pass on uh, the <laughs> Transportation <laughs> Advisory Committee. I think you yeah, got it covered. If you could recap the presentation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be helpful. <laughs> the clock's gonna start spinning. All right, Superintendent, back to you. All right, back to me. Quick, quick question. Oh, this please. might be new business, but I, I mean, I thought it might put, fall into policy. But um, if we do want to move forward with CISL, right, in January, have we looked into what we have to do as a elected body to reinstate or form a new Subcommittee, is that a vote that needs to be taken? Does it need multiple readings? Like if it so, does, then um, I'd be interested to hear what other people think. But it's our, it's in our standing committees already. Okay. So to <clears throat> me, it wouldn't require a reconstitution. It's just a matter of you populating that committee. Okay. It's almost That's like it's almost like trying to reorg a parks commission, uh, parks department <laughs> when it was never <laughs> no, when it not. when it was never officially but I guess I, made a department. I'd be oh, open okay. to other thoughts. I mean, I we could, yeah, we would. I would. I mean, I think the objective is the same, but you might, we just might we want, want to, to the, yeah, yeah the, the name of it and some of the purposes. Yeah, and I think actually, I know that um, we've posted sort of general descriptions on our website. I think we should incorporate those for each committee into the policies when we do our update. 
Mm -hmm. um, so if we want to do that now and actually define what the curriculum committee policy or purpose is, I think that would, this would be a good time to do it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> that sounds good. We have that um, penciled in for our, our next meeting. Okay. Correct to have yes. some discussion around that, and actually, Miss Walker, I was going to reach out to you to say, <laughs> so would that be something we would need to vote on? And yeah, if, I mean, if you want to bring that up, maybe put it on your policy agenda just for okay. a little discussion before our next meeting. Okay, we'll add that to our agenda. That sounds good. in case you have a recommendation. Okay. okay. Uh, superintendent's report. All right. So tomorrow, obviously, is an important date for us to vote. So that's a really important piece second more important piece for us is professional development so we um, I just want to give it just a quick overview um, we've partnered with Pentucket and Triton and I think this is um, our assistant superintendent Lisa Marie Ippolito when when she's uh, came here she's been working with the other assistant superintendents um, so the idea is to have like a tri-town PD so uh, tomorrow, we're going to be sending our service providers, our IAs, along with our specialists, PE, art, and music, um, over to Pentucket to collaborate with all of their IAs, um, service providers, and their specialists. So this professional development that um, Triton and also the Pentucket uh, assistant principal, assistant superintendents have set up for our people, we're going to be hosting. Um, the rest of um, approximately around, including Newburyport and Pentucket and some Triton people, uh, around 300 educators. And we have three sessions going on. Um, and we're excited about it. So uh, Mr. Eatman and Cultural 7 are going to be doing Managing Conflict with Empathy and kind of um, the write-up and what they're looking to get out of that is, you know, what does conflict mean? Uh, with the educators and then what are ways to deal with conflicts um, for them giving them some strategies and then how um, emotional intelligence and empathy help us face and deal with uh, and solve conflicts so uh, that he's as you all know you've worked with Michael and he's phenomenal with that so that's going to be that focus we also have a um, another consultant from the um, his firm is going to be uh, working with the same idea on conflict. Um, and then his is empathy, um, intention versus impact with Pascal Musto. Um, and he's looking at um, really taking the same idea. Um, in his session, what they're looking to get is uh, best intentions, uh, why that could have uh, why is the impact of statements sometimes harmful? So taking really uh, best in intentions. What are some things that keep in mind to ensure that one's impact reflects one's intentions? And then how can we respond to someone with impact that um, someone's impact that was hurtful despite their intentions? So really look at intention and impact um, with educators in having uh, discussions on that. And last but not least, Constructive dialogue, as we all know, we've been utilizing this in Newburyport, working with Essential Partners, but our own Dr. Tom Abrams will be running um, constructive dialogue uh, to critical thought. Um, so he'll be working with all the educators and how to set up a constructive dialogue. So his, uh, some of the outcomes uh, define constructive dialogue, be able to differentiate it from debate and discussion. Understand to be able to uh, use skills, full spectrum of listening, questions of inquiry to engage students in deeper and more complex understanding. And then also identi identify uh, curriculum areas or roles that could strengthen from the application of these skills to increase student learning, engagement, and empathy. So it's really kind of taking a lot of that, um, those areas and working with educators tomorrow. So we're excited to partner with Pentucket and Triton. And it's our first time bringing everyone together. So we're, um, you know, kind of consolidating and work together, I think, as a, as a region. So, yeah. Any questions on that? All right. And then um, last but not least, the 
uh, NEF auction. Mr. Wolf had to leave early. He's working on his jokes tonight. But yes, uh, we are emceeing the uh, auction on Saturday night. So I do believe it was Mr. Callahan, who's also the rep on the NEF, when I came late to that meeting. I yeah, think you probably put him. Yeah, he, he nominated. <laughs> So, you know, just don't be late to meetings and uh, no, I'm excited as, as we all know, the NEF is a great organization. Um, they just do so much for our kids and families. So we'll see. It's, it's like the Academy Award. So I'll either get asked to go back next year or that will be it. So. If anybody remembers the, um, the bingo during COVID emergency remote, he was the Calling the numbers on he was, that. You were there last year. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. that one, too. I, yeah. Great. It's funny. And Andy yeah. helped out with the uh, other one, too. Yeah. <laughs> the exact same thing, calling bingo and then emceeing a yeah. auction gala. <laughs> <laughs> My career is skyrocketing from bingo <laughs> to MC in the NEF. Big promotion there, yeah. It is. We um, had an idea that didn't come, uh, didn't actually happen, unfortunately, but the paddles, you know, for the when people... Um, yes. Bid. They were supposed to be your face on oh, one that side, be great. Oh. so that when all raised, it'd be a sea of Gallagher faces. But <laughs> I don't know. There's still time. I no, mean. no. They already got the regular ones. Oh. Too bad. I have. <laughs> and just one last thing. It's not. It Michael wanted a new business, but uh, tomorrow, um, you know, that's uh, Veterans Day. Veterans Day this week. But tomorrow we're bringing in veterans from different generations to have kind of like a town hall and small group discussions with our students at the middle school. So uh, that starts eight to nine. Um, and it just, I think, really hits home what Veterans Day is all about uh, for our kids and for our staff and for us to take a moment and reflect on what's really important. And tomorrow will be another learning opportunity for that, so. Great, thank you. Do we have any other new business? Okay, then I will make a motion that we enter executive session. We will not be returning to open session. Second. We need a roll call vote. Ms. Yell. Yes. Sarah Hall? Yes. Brianna Higgins? Yes. Bruce Menon? Yes. Steve Cole? Yes. Brian Callahan? Yes. Yes.